Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 374, that's 364, 364, con me, Agostino, what's going on, how you doing? Great, amazing. If it's your first time around these parts, I cover some of the best and breaking, right, thought-provoking news that I come across on the internet and everything else in between. So strap on, grab a drink and sit back and enjoy. If it's your first time, check out the show. Of course, make sure you smash that subscribe button, hit like, and also leave me a comment down below if you have any comments regarding the show. If you're listening to the show via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review, download the show and share it with your friends, put it in an envelope, send it to your mum and tell her to text me later, all right? All those things. Not not much. I'm not asking for that much. And if you want to support the show on Patreon, please do. The link is down below. Patreon.com forces Agostino. That's patreon.com forces Agostino. Every little counts during these hard and stressful times when I feel like I should um leap out the window like a scene out of Game of Thrones and just fall to my escape. But if you click the link on Patreon, I can stay one more day drinking one more shitty room temperature Cronenberg via your support on Patreon. So support the show via Patreon for as little as $1 to get access to my entire library of shows, as well as this show you're listening to in full audio format before it gets anywhere else. Before it's on Apple, before it's on Spotify, before it's on any other platform, you can find it on Patreon ahead of time before anywhere else gets in. If you know, I usually do the premiere of my show in full on YouTube a few days later from when I post the clips and stuff, and the clips I don't post, all the stuff that I'm talking about on the show, I just post the more, you know, maybe... Um, Pony and stuff in terms of time but if you want to catch the whole show before it's released anywhere else make sure you sign up on patreon don't delay patreon.com for us agostino that's patreon.com for us a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o the link shall be in the descriptions down below if you're watching via youtube it should be at a pink comment if you're listening via podcast app, it should be in the description click for more info and get involved man god damn it who ha huh? i feel good do i feel good yeah i feel all right actually i'm i'm i'm, I'm not too bad isn't it <coughs> covid lockdown it's waves isn't it <coughs> you have waves like um you go through you go through yeah you have um waves of emotion there's times that you wake up you're like oh let's just end this all like long thing right there's other days where you're like oh let's go get it right you're up reading you're writing you're doing push-ups you're running um you're staying off of social media you're doing all the things that you should be doing and then suddenly the next day comes along and you're spending half of your day catching up on 90 day fiance right it's a whole load of bull crap but you know what what can we do right what can we do if anything i think we've all come over the hump we've all kind of realized <coughs> well, i think people would sense have realized that hey this is going to be our reality until at least probably until the beginning of next year. So we're just going to have to um, make do and do what we can. And for those, you know, I, I mentioned prior, prior, like how, um, how things have changed, right? So do you remember all the people that were kicking up, kicking up a fuss online and offline about people that are going on holiday? And I think I might cover it as well on the podcast. I've covered some stories about people leaving and going to Greece, going to Spain, you know, and, and basically, you know, in a weird way, people were kind of criticizing their decision, saying they were selfish, they're going to put other people at risk, blah, 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 blah. But seeing how things have transpired, seeing that it effectively everyone that's even the countries that have done a good job are still seeing this like second third spike whatever we're all kind of approaching now i guess it probably has to do with um, um us approaching flu season in most places and um, people are going to be indoors it's going to be winter um there's going to be more chance for this virus to spread incubate all that good nasty stuff so if ever there was a time to take a holiday it was then right it was like what march all the way until maybe the end of august that should have been a time you should have probably snuck out not given a crap what anyone said up Uploaded your pictures online, ignored all the hate comments, and just kept it moving. Same could be said for all the business techno lot, right? Remember all those guys that were going around the country, going around the world, playing um, their you know formulaic techno music to a crowd full of people who don't like to dance, and we're all kind of custom and like, oh my god, how could you go there? Oh, Peggy Goo, look at her, she's all about the money. Oh, Sven Van, there, Chris Liebling, there, hypocrite, all this stuff. Now look at us, say eh? we're thinking actually. Considering how long we're going to all be out of action in terms of living our regular, uh, regular lives, it probably makes sense. Even if you're the, I, I would, because that's the thing I, I don't like about this situation that we're in. Everyone's pocket watching. Everyone's sort of like minding everyone else's business, right? Getting involved in what they like, kind of like trying to uh, psychoanalyze what people are doing, um, trying to judge their decisions that they're, you know, that they're making for the betterment of themselves and their family. It's like, it's none of our business, right? We should never, ever have the, um, you know, feel as if we're comfortable enough to say those kind of things. But I guess because we're all indoors, we have literally, literally, nothing to do right 
we could, we have nothing else better to do but then to kind of speculate on other people's movements and criticize what they're doing. But in effect, if you look at it and you think, hey, even if you're the top DJ, even if you're someone that's earning 20k per gig, how long is that really going to last you? Especially if you have a lifestyle that I'm assuming, because you know, from what I've read and from what I know, and reading in between the lines, a lot of people who are kind of maybe um, image rich, I guess, is that on the feed on the IG feed, uh, people that are people that kind of um, people that are the main proponents for uh, FOMO culture, they're usually the type to rent a lot of things, right? To lease stuff, basically to, um, which you can afford if you've got the money, right? You can afford to basically live in a really swanky apartment somewhere, lease it for like, I don't know, um, a gazillion, you know, 10 grand a month or something stupid like that, right? But as long as you've got money coming in, it, it doesn't matter where you basically live. You can kind of, you know, you can kind of make it make sense. It doesn't really make sense if you think about it. It probably is better that you actually go and buy your own place in cash. But if you have the means to afford, you know, a uh, monthly rent of 5K plus, you can possibly live in some pretty decent places that will look amazing on the timeline. But those people, they very, they, they 100%, you know, basically rely on a lot of income coming their way right they're a lot they, they rely on a lot of kind of appearance fees djs whatever it may be sponsorships and without the movement of the world without people being able to freely move and do what they need to do and products and services you know basically get back where they need to get you're not going to be able to command that level of income so even if you're a top dj you probably need to work right you probably your money might have run out already you need to get back on the road and start gigging and i'd imagine a lot of people especially the top people yeah they're taking some cuts they're taking some discounts in terms of rates but i would imagine a lot of them are still commanding their standard fees because if ever there's a time where you can be a little bit like you know you can push back and say hey i really need you to cover at least 90 percent of my original fee if not the whole thing would be now right you could basically argue that hey i've, I've been out, i've been out of work for like six months you could basically argue that i've been out of work for six months as a dj even though i get paid 30k per gig i still need um income of that uh magnitude to make it actually make work or to make it or to make it make sense so um now i'm just saying that i have a lot more sympathy i guess i guess because time has gone on and now we know that we're probably going to be out of action for a year you know people need to do what i have to do to kind of put food in the place keep the lights on you know to put make sure they've got clothes on their back i don't bemoan anybody a decision that they make it's not really my business i'm not getting involved in that shit and um i look at the business technical stuff and i think again even at a time when I was kind of um, keeping abreast on it, it did feel a lot like sour grapes. It did feel a lot like jealousy for the most part. Yes, there were some fundamental issues at hand in terms of um, how that group of people basically approached dance music, uh, their motives, um, the way that they view consumers, the, the way that they view their fans, um, the way they conduct business in general, the lack of diversity. There are some real issues there, right? But I think overall, especially when you look for it in the prism of COVID, I think a lot of the issues came from just stemmed originally mostly from jealousy because so-and-so couldn't get a gig somewhere. They're struggling as it is. And then imagine, right, you're struggling as it is to get gigs. You're not getting any placement on albums. People don't give a crap about you mix, remixing their EP. You're completely out, it feels like, of the scene and you're not getting a look in. And then you're seeing all these people who are in the business crew, especially that's a problem too because that business techno collective there's a few standout people but for the most part they're all much of a muchness right you can flick a coin you know you couldn't I, I would i would dare to say if you walked into a club and it was a business techno lineup and someone and you close your eyes you had no idea what the lineup was you won't be able to tell the difference of somebody even jump if, even if one set started after the next you probably won't be able to tell they all kind of blend into each other with the exception of maybe three to five people everyone's sort of the same sort of vibe so imagine that person you're not getting any gigs not getting any placements you think everyone in that business techno scene is shit and then suddenly during a global pandemic when everyone er, everyone's basically hurting no one's getting gigs the economy is shut down you know live events are completely being kaput um if anything dance music or nightclub or nightlife in general that's going probably going to be the last thing to come back when everything reopens and then the first people you see playing at these events that they're putting on are the business techno lot. You're like, hold on, what the fuck? Especially if you believe the narrative of like, oh man, which we all believed in the beginning. Now it's going to go back to the roots of what dance music was about. We're going to be promoting local artists and it's going to go back to DIY culture and people doing it for the love. And well, no, it, it didn't actually, innit? what actually ended up happening was that the promoters who lost out the most or the promoters that basically put on the most events during the year in, in an effort to kind of cover their nut and make sure that they're having income coming in they would go out and book the people who they know can sell tickets especially if you're uh, operating at a, a, a reduced capacity under 
within the midst of COVID, you need to make sure that you're selling tickets to make it worthwhile. Um, I'd imagine there's going to be some um, stipulation with events, with the, sorry, with the venue themselves too, right? They're not going to allow you just to come in willy nilly and just put on an event for 10 people, especially if they're going to have to go through all the, you know, health and safety recommendations um, to make sure that the event goes on in the first place. So yeah, man, I think now that time has gone on, I think I'm a little bit more sympathetic to that whole um, idea of getting back on the road and doing your thing. And I think it is what it is, isn't it? Let, let people go and earn their money, man. I don't think we should be bemoaning that. And to be honest, I just want to go out and rave again, honestly. I've done my parrot session. I've recorded a couple sets I'm going to actually release. Um, hopefully next week, I've got to um, do a bit of editing on them, but I should hopefully stream some of those net or premiere there, sorry, directly on my YouTube channel. So definitely keep an eye out for that. But I've done the pirate sessions. I've listened to somebody play in a open air setting. I did an open deck the other day at venue MOT. Yeah, that was a venue I did um, actually the other day on Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. That was pretty. That's pretty fun. Um, bit. I was a bit rusty to be fair. It's playing in front of a live audience is obviously you know ten times harder than it is playing by yourself in your room. Bloody, you know, mixing at Pirate Studios, wherever it may be, or, or even streaming live via YouTube. It's not the same thing, man. It really isn't the same thing. That's one of the issues I think with DJ actually going forward. We need to see maybe an explosion of smaller venues let's say from that uh, let's say 500 capacity downwards maybe 200 capacity 250 capacity downwards right we need more of those venues we need more places for people like myself who are on the like you know lower to approaching mid-level to have a place that you can go and play weekly um with a captive audience um so you can hone your craft because if we're relying on just mixing at home or playing on fucking nts on something you're not going to get good you're not going to get better you're just not Yes, it's a good look for you and it looks great on your CV and everyone's going to be like, oh shit, you're on NTS, that's a big look. But in general, if you actually want to be a legit DJ and you want to actually leave your imprint on this dance music timeline, you want to be able, you want to contribute to some people's, you know, lasting memories of a great night. You want to have the potential of maybe putting together a classic EP, a classic album, a single or two, a video, wherever it may be, you really need to be in front of the people. You need to be amongst them. Same way, you know, in order to get good, I think in general, just have good music music taste you need to go out more right same way with you know but to say if you want to if you want to sound if you want to um, sound more articulate you should read more right um or write more right um if you want to get better at running you run same thing with djing like you just have to immerse yourself into it but you need to be amongst the people you need to be where the action is you can't be just doing it at home on your own or in front of a dead in front of nobody right you need to have an audience that you can play to an audience that can grow with you an audience that you can learn from bounce ideas do you know what I mean? Like sonically and all that good stuff. Like it needs to happen. So that's the one thing I'm hoping that we see going forward. Um, uh, an up, an uptick in those kind of venues, even if they're kind of DIY, undercover things that they're not, you know, all the way legit. We need something. We definitely do need it because, at the moment, you know, as much as people like to rag on, again, I like to rag on some of the techno, the business techno guys. The 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 reason why they get paid paid so often and they usually pretty decent at what they do even though i'm not a fan of their work is that they get to play in front of a live audience weekly all the time right and sometimes two to three gigs per night right you're playing in places you're honing your craft you're, you're getting sent demos you're testing them out on the dance floor you're seeing the reaction you're then you're making edits when you go back to your hotel room you're just rinsing and repeating that is what's going to make you really really stand out from the rest and even though you know guys like myself could say hey i could definitely hold a candle to some of those guys a back-to-back -back set it, that's not the same right they've been playing big room places for donkey years like they'll completely embarrass you in that kind of setting so as confident as you can be in your own ability you still need the reality you the reality is a lot of people myself included need that platform to play in those kind of places and i think once that's done as well you'll see a lot less complaints online you won't see a lot of people you know complaining about all white lineups and all that sort of stuff i think most of the reason that is, is the case is because unfortunately most of the big djs for the most part are all you know fairly caucasian in that regard don't know why that is don't ask me the question i don't really care i'm all about solutions and i think the solutions to get around it is and number one to put on your own nights of course if you don't if you don't like what's going on out there just put on your own thing i'm a big believer in you know actions speak louder than words so that's a great thing but number two another great thing would be just to kind of have a a, a venue just a place where everyone can play everyone can play that isn't playing so that um you can you know again develop your sound build an audience um you know get some new fans whatever it may be that's probably the way to go i think going forward in my opinion anyway but hey what do i know anyway main stuff to go into let's let's dive on deep loads of topics to run through here um number what should we do? Yeah, number one topic actually to get through 
It's this pretty funny video. Hold on, let me see if I can get up on here. Da, 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 da. Number one topic to get through is this hilarious video of a pro, an anti-mask protest in Utah um, that basically went viral, I guess, um, this, well, yeah, throughout the day or throughout last week. Um, some very interesting characters. And again, just a very cool um, host of characters who I would say are... Um, representative maybe of maybe the fr it's weird though because sometimes i see these videos and i think oh this is just a fringe these are all the nutty the nutty americans but if you watch a lot of these videos online like i do and you you know spend your time on garbage news spend your time watching garbage news clips and stuff you would know that this isn't this isn't um oh is this is this true oh my god this isn't flipping um this isn't a uh fringe group of people there is a, a strong growing group of people who fundamentally think COVID is a hoax. It's not a real thing. The government is lying to you, all this sort of nonsense. And they routinely go out and protest on the streets. And especially they go, they go in front of governor's houses and basically protest against mandates or laws or whatnot um, in order to kind of put pressure on them to, I guess, reverse the decision. And this is one, uh, one, one example that probably took the biscuit in terms of the stuff I've seen recently. Now, hundreds have gathered here in front of the Washington County Administration building, calling for the end of a mask mandate, saying they are tired of not living their normal lives. No more masks! No more masks! Not on the backs of my kids, or you're going to get more federal funding. That's how I feel about that. A passionate call for action by... I don't know what the kids thing is. I guess in some states, in order to kind of appeal to people's common sense, some governors are like, hey... We want to look after your children. We don't want you to like have kids. You don't want, we don't want your kids to pass on the virus to grandma or grandpa. But I guess in some states, if you if you even mention people's kids, I guess in America, it's a trigger for some parents to be like, hey, that that's sacred ground. You can't even mention their liking, their likeness. You know what I mean? Um, even what, you just can't mention them whatsoever because it triggers them in that regard in terms of being very protective. Um, especially when you think of the anti vax a lot and all that sort of good stuff. So. Maybe that's the case, but that's a very strange way to kind of, you know, um, protest against masks, I think. Friday morning in St. George, several police officers on standby as many locals called concerns about coronavirus spikes overblown. The flu kills more than coronavirus. Imagine doing that to your child. Imagine getting your child in front of a camera and let them say that. Like, that's, is that a form of um, child abuse? I would say so, right? Others calling the virus a hoax or stating that asymptomatic carriers simply do not exist. What? And they cannot be forced to wear masks anywhere as citizens of the United States. If we so imagine, imagine if that's true. Imagine if they say, okay, asymptomatic car carriers don't exist because I guess they're saying that because uh, um, that's probably the main reason why we're all kind of locked down, right? Asymptomatic people. Um, if this virus just affected a certain segment of the population or you know or there wasn't such a thing as asymptomatic and if you got it sometimes you survive or you didn't you know what i mean like or you or you, it wasn't it wasn't transferable from one person to the other if you didn't show symptoms that would be much better to handle or it would, i guess the economy wouldn't be as as badly damaged if that was the case but let's imagine that it just affects you just like a virus like you know let's imagine it affects you like a, what's a good example not cold not chicken pots like diarrhea you get diarrhea and it's just you that has it right you can't pass it on to somebody else in that regard let's can you pass on diarrhea I don't know. let's just imagine you can't pass on diarrhea so what because of that if the whole nation is like you know ravaged by this toxic diarrhea are you just going to keep going on and living your everyday life wouldn't you want some kind of resolution to be found for everybody so that for all people so you could all be you could all have peace of mind when you go out again like that's a very very backwards logic i think isn't it just because they think asymptomatic people don't exist doesn't mean you can just reopen the economy as you wish and just take off your mask or not even wear a mask in the first place that doesn't make any sense if you want to wear a mask that's fine we can take care of ourselves some rally attendees say they shouldn't ever wear masks if they have any medical issues or mental health concerns or if they feel they simply can't breathe when george floyd was saying i can't breathe and then he died and now we're wearing a mask and we say i can't breathe but we're being forced to wear it anyway the I legit, I legit question whether or not she even knows how to spell her name, like legitimately, or whether or not she knows how to write in general, because that's a mad, mad statement to come out with, right? Trying to equate um, wearing of a mask um, in any way, shape or form to what happened to George Floyd is maddening. Um, and then, uh, but then to be fair to her as well, I don't think she's trying to be rude. 
I just think she's trying to do that classic thing that everyone does where you try and use the tragedy that happened. You, it's, it's a bit of what about is a minute. You try and use a, tra a recent tragedy to basically support the claim that you're making. Is that, is that basically a still man or a straw man argument? I don't know. One of those kind of, one of those sayings or one of those wacky phrases, but I'm sure that's what she's just doing. She just thinks she's being clever in that regard. And it's a bit Fox News-ish, isn't it? That technique of using like a recent tragedy to kind of reinforce whatever point you're trying to make. But this is, that's a stretch and a half, isn't it? George Floyd, coronavirus, like what? But we're being forced to write anyway. But many say that they believe in all and it feels like a skit, doesn't it? It feels like an SNL skit. It doesn't even feel real. All cases mass jeopardize kids' health. Parents are demanding they have the right to decide what to do with their children. I'll tell you another reason I'd hate masks. Most child molesters love them. School administrators were... I don't think that's actually true, though, legitimately. Do you think... I don't know. Maybe she's confusing child molesters with serial killers. Serial killers tend to cover their face. Um, you know, um, I guess... Child molesters, I don't think, do cover their faces. Um, you know, some would argue, yeah, no, they don't cover their, cover their faces. But again, mad, maddening statement. I don't even know why I'm trying to dignify her with a flipping, uh, a rational response. But god damn it, responding that they don't understand why crowds are protesting them based on a mandate given by the governor. They blocked off the uh, front entrance to the school building, and we went out to ask them to move, and they uh, attempted to storm the school building. The school board is implementing the governor's recent order that face shields alone are not enough. And if a parent is adamant that their child cannot wear a mask or a shield, they must... What is that? I identify as a fresh air breather. Jesus Christ, man. That's the thing, isn't it? If you rag on about identity politics, unfortunately, you're going to get this... This is going to be the negative reaction. They're going to use that against you. Again, it's, it's a quite a clever tactic, to be fair, right? If people are going around identifying as chairs, as penguins and dolphins and and they and they are and all that sort of nonsense then suddenly people are going to come out and take the piss out of it identify as a fresh air breather but god damn it this whole affair is just wild wild isn't it? that video is wild they're protesting an anti-mask mandate in front of a school that has nothing to do with the mandate itself they didn't even go in front of the governor's house i guess it's symbolic because it's a school you're trying to make your point but honestly man it's, and again, it's not even an American thing. I'm sure this 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 type of people exist in all countries. Um, it's just funnier, you know, in the American accent under the American uh, flag, because you know they have this superiority complex about them. But when push comes to shove, man, the ones that are actually on the streets, um, you know, kicking up a fuss are the dum dums of the of their society, in it really. Um, even even some of the protests that happen in the name of Black Lives Matter. They're going around burning all their local communities, you know, um, trashing local businesses uh, in the name of police brutality, you know. And then when they come face to face with police, they're throwing Molotov cocktails at them, fireworks, punches, all this sort of nonsense, killing random veterans. I like, who's that veteran that died recently, right, at one of the protests? And then, and then you got this anti-mask protest happening. It's just a wild time, man. a wild time, a wild, wild time. Anyway, let's move on. Can we get another tissue here? Bear with me. Bear with me. Oh, God. Hey, Fever is always playing up. It tends to kind of flare up, especially when it starts to get a bit cooler. And my um, I've run out of uh, juice in my asthma pump, so uh, please bear with me if you hear any sniffles in the background or that sort of malarkey or sort of clogged upness. You know, it is what it is. I have allergies! But what can you do? Anyway, moving on in. Um, funny thing over the just over the last couple of days, I guess Skepta has a thing for Pretty Patel. Um, he posted a picture of her on his um, Twitter account, and the Twitter sphere went crazy about it. People saying she's gonna deport you, bro. How can you support her? Blah 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 blah. And it's just like, what? How triggering was it, right? One image of Pretty Patel sitting in a House of Commons, looking rather voluptuous, uh, looking rather wide hip, looking like she's dragging an absolute wagon behind there um and just looking pretty scrumptious right got that kind of hey are you gonna are you gonna be on that ps5 all day look right wherever it may be but it's just funny because number one i didn't know i again i wasn't paying attention to politics prior to starting this podcast or prior to lockdown now there's nothing else to really keep you know keep me entertained so i've kind of learned about pretty patel in the last what few months or so and she does really divide opinion in it if anything most people on twitter seem to hate her but i guess that's because i follow a lot of left-leaning people but she doesn't um, especially when you consider that she's a minority and a woman in politics, she doesn't get any of the grace that you'd think or benefit of that you'd think that she should get for her um, for her ethnic 
and whatever what yeah ethnic background or whatever or racial background right you'd think that you did kind of prop her up a bit more she'd get a bit more you know airtime she'd be um hosting pound discussions about women in politics and doing all that nonsense but if anything because she's a tory and because she um is what a race denier or she is a what would you call them in in an, in an asian indian world would you say she's a banana right is that a thing that they say i don't know whatever it may be right or coconut whatever uh people tend to kind of or people everyone accuses her of and then i guess skeptic to bear the brunt of some of that because he posts a picture of her and uh people are now you know essentially going off to skeptic which is weird um um, I guess it's weird for him in general because you know if 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 anyone is Teflon in the UK is Skepta right only only Skepta could have two close friends one what one in prison for rape and you know in what you call it, and kidnapping the other one in prison for manslaughter and have no, nothing and have it not affect his career whatsoever zero again I'm not into canceling I'm not into that whatsoever I don't give a shit but it does back up my opinion that council culture doesn't exist for black people it just doesn't um, you know how long did it take for R. Kelly to finally be brought to justice? Bill Cosby, right? It was, and these, uh, both of these individuals were well known within their own societies to be creeps and to be bad actors, bad dudes, right? But it took years and years and years of, you know, and it only really changed because of the current climate, right? But especially in the, uh, the post-Me Too era, it was just impossible for R. Kelly to exist, right? He just had to get cancelled in some way, shape or form. Same can be said for Bill Cosby. But I think outside of that, outside of those two guys, no, nothing that a black person does in entertainment can get them cancelled. Nothing. Zero. It doesn't happen. It's not a thing. Maybe in sports, that might be an issue, um, especially if you rely on the paycheck through the sports channels, whether it's, you know, Michael Vick with, you know, um, dog fighting, whether it's uh, the British press, uh, you know, uh, smear campaign against, you know, Mason Greenwood is happening at the moment. If he gets into a couple more, you know, uh, fracases or, you know, s you know, unfortunate instances he will probably end up it will probably end up affecting his career but i think apart from that i can't think of anyone else in hip-hop in grime and rap and afro beats even who's who's the afro beats guy who got accused of rape as well right he's and his cases got completely dropped like nothing you know it didn't affect anything in his way either it just seems to be i don't know what, what it is maybe it's because as a as a group of as a race of people or as a group of people or as a subculture we just don't give a crap about it in general but it's just quite interesting to see it right that the thing that's getting more pushback from skeptor the thing that kind of is causing him the most grief online which i'm sure he doesn't give a shit about is him just posting an innocuous picture of pretty patel sitting down in the house of commons but when it comes to anybody pulling him up about his friends who you know two of his friends are associated with uh, bbk who are now in prison for some very very serious crimes nothing gets affected no sponsors dropping no shows cancelled uh no record label you know no record yeah no album scrapped nothing zero it's just again you, you can't blame the guy for the sins of his friends but still you know these are people that are known associates of that group work closely linked to them right uh plenty of shout outs on on dubs and stuff you know directly if anything you would imagine if this happened to anyone else outside of hip-hop that there will be an issue right imagine if i don't know let's throw it out there harry one of harry styles friends was accused of roofing a couple of girls and got convicted for it but harry styles would be in a lot of bother right he couldn't just appear on fallon the next day like nothing happened he'd have to address it in some way shape or form he'd be called you know people would be questioning whether or not he actually knew if he took part was he complicit blah 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 but for skeptics seems to be pretty you know pretty teflon so this these attacks won't really work um it's just funny as well just watching it on the timeline people freaking out because he's posting a picture of somebody that he might think looks attractive it's just funny anyway just from the outside looking in but what can you do next on the list what do we have here oh we have some news that's a, which might affect us in the uk so this guy I follow on Twitter called Richard Chambers has basically said that he basically broke the news that supposedly in Dublin, is it that he said, right? In Dublin, that's where he's from, I'm assuming, right? Dublin supposedly is moving to level three in terms of uh, COVID response, uh, visiting to private homes, um, up to maximum of six people, maximum uh, of one other in the house of visitors. And it says Martin, whoever the person Martin was, I think it's probably one of their ministers, confirms that indoor dining will be closed in the capital from midnight which I guess should be an indication that we might see a localized lockdown in London 
um, sooner rather than later, especially if the numbers keep on creeping up. Um, and yeah, like I said, man, I just don't think these businesses are going to survive. There's no way that restaurants and bars can survive a second lockdown. It's just not going to happen. So uh, pray for everyone's small businesses out there. And if you can support these people during this weekend um, or during this week, uh, please make sure you do. Next on the list, we have this interesting interview actually with this guy called Mark Geiger, right? He sat down with Variety. I think I might have covered this, but this is basically a development on this. Um, he's, he's a head of, where is he? So this is one interview. So he's the head of music at Warner Brothers, right? Warner Music Entertainment. Uh, and he basically sat down with Variety early in the year and, and said, don't expect any concerts before 2022, right? And his argument was that, hey, um, until there's a vaccine, we're not going to be able to put on any concerts. And there's also the question of, there's also the issue of insurance, right? Many insurance companies won't, won't want to be liable for anything until they are 99 to 100% sure that you can run an event safely. So, you know, uh, put a kibosh on any sort of event happening uh, before 2022, which really is a big um breaking news to say because that's going to affect some of the biggest festivals like Coachella's and and all these other good stuff and and you know and uh what was the other one Glastonbury and stuff that you know who delayed their festival until next year pretty earlier on in the year um it looks like they might have to delay maybe another year on top of that but then he then followed it up with another interview that he did with IQ magazine where he said um he believes that the when things open up it's going to go back to like the roaring 20s we're going to have an ear a kind of a phase or a period in time where people are going to be so starved for entertainment and so starved for going out that there won't be enough events to house people in which i definitely agree with i think as bleak as it can look i still have the optimism that once things start to settle down once we start to have a grip on the virus once some we get some developments on the vaccine because i think by and large the vaccine seems to be the one kill shot in terms of getting things back to normal so i think there's going to be a ramping up on the research and development into that make sure you know the testing goes well and then try and uh, our best to get it out to the public I think that's going to be a major thing because essentially that vaccine is going to be able to save many different industries, many different economies around the world. And, you know, there's a lot on the line, basically, a lot of money on the line. And effectively, from the COVID response, what we've seen in general, even from the outside looking in, I think we can all agree that COVID responses have only changed or things have only got better due to um, yeah, I've only got better in sectors where the money was at stake, right? You look at sports, you look at some live shows, um, you look at some entities where they've sort of made the adjustments necessary in order to kind of put the events on. You look at what Dana White did with the UFC, you know, he went all the way down, he went all the way down to, what is it, UAE or the um, Abu Dhabi to put on, you know, to basically host events there. He did everything in his power to make that work. So, and that was all mostly because, you know, there was too much money on the line to cancel the entire cards coming up for the year. So I definitely agree with what he says. So this is from IQ Magazine. Mark Geiger says the following, COVID-19 uh, will give way to a roaring 2020s. Um, so the article says the following, says Mark Geiger has predicted a boom time in live entertainment after the threat of COVID recedes, saying the current claustrophobia economy, which I agree with, it's a good term, will give way to a second roaring 20s marked by high consumer confidence and economic growth. WMZ, former global head of music, okay, so he's left the position, uh, told the IFF keynote compared uh, the current coronavirus pandemic to the Spanish flu, which gripped the world in 1918 to 19, 1920, killing an estimated 50 million people. Years of everyone cooped up at home, he said, created a joyous time called the Roaring Twenties. And I think 2022, his estimate from when the current pandemic uh, will subside will give way to a second Roaring Roaring Twenties. Again, he's still reiterating that 2022 will be the day, will be the year, sorry, um, which is concerning for all of us live music fans. They said the prediction and the and, and executive renowned for spotted music trends will, will welcome news for the live music industry and professionals nearly 600 of which are attending a virtual interactive festival forum on september the 2nd and 3rd the keynote interview conducted by goldman sachs lisa yang ended the first day of the iff conference programming on the optimistic note and also touched on the incredible growth of music streaming and yang's prediction for the concert sector post coronavirus uh, recovery said yang said that she believed that the global industry has lost around 75 percent of its value this year but will recover to around 60 
65 of its pre-COVID level in 2021. The recovery will likely be completed by 2022, he, she said. In the midterm, Yang con continues that the outlook is uncertain. It's going to be tough, she said. There are so many external factors that no one can control. But from a structural perspective, I think the industry is going to come back. It's not a question of if, but when. So I definitely agree with that. Um, I think that's true. I do think that we're going to there, there is going to be a fatigue. I think there for the even for I think I I think I've mentioned it prior, but I even noticed when I when I was DJing that you know some of the public holidays, right, bank holidays, and you know the Halloween's and the New Year's usually the worst time to go and DJ because the people that are out were just the ones that don't necessarily go out too often and they have their kind of one crazy night affair. Um, but I do think that same group of people have been so wound up and so ground to the, you know, so smashed to the ground in terms of, um, you know, overall sentiment for what's going on COVID that they will be gagging to go out again. And then you include those guys with people like myself and you yourself, if you're listening or watching, who go out quite regularly, I think there's going to be a lot of people outdoors um, attending events, going to live gigs. And even on myself, I can say from my experience or from, um, you know, the f lessons that I've learned during COVID is like, you know, not to take these live events for granted, right? Um, I'm going to be recording stuff. I'm going to be taking pictures. I'm going to be attending local gigs, just in, you know, bars and pubs around the area that I live, um, going to actual performances and go and watch people follow them around the country. I'm going to do all that I can do to experience everything that I can experience live. Um, you know, going to galleries, all this sort of good stuff on weekends just to walk around because we, we took it for granted prior, right? So when stuff reopens, when the economy gets back to some semblance of normalcy um you would be you know you urge yourself to try to rewrite those wrongs so i think myself included you know i think i'm a bit of a uh, a bit of a hardcore case in that regard i like to go out quite often i think if i take myself as an example when i take a you know the regular regular person i think they're definitely looking at it the same way and like you know what we're gonna definitely be going out more often when things reopen so um hopefully that's the case um i'm optimistic that the you know it comes a bit forward we don't want it to be 2022 but hey if that's the case and that's when we have to go out then i'll accept that as well no biggie on that regard okay um what else to talk about oh this is actually a good one to get on so i i'm sure some of you are aware some of the audience are aware of the ongoing beef that's occurring at the moment between joe budden and charlemagne the god regarding podcasting and the business of podcasting and all this sort of good stuff and it's getting a bit boring at the moment right they're, they're sort of you know they're essentially both saying the same thing but doing business in different ways and i think everyone can coexist and make a lot of money there's no need for people to start you know um what you call it uh basically dissing each other in public that's not very necessary uh podcasting is a new space we as us content creators the people that are actually putting the podcast making the podcast we can rewrite the rules we can set the terms um you know there's no point of people getting you know um putting bad deals and all this sort of good stuff because you know it's a new fresh market and i guess a lot of people from what i've seen online were basically siding with charlemagne and basically and andrew schultz and and agreeing with the fact that yeah siding with them in terms of saying joe budden's business isn't all the way correct and all the bad deals that he gets in are usually a fault of himself and not the fault of the white man or the corporation which is what joe's basically arguing against but joe's mostly arguing against the fact that you know the actual fundamental business of podcasting at the moment with his corporation isn't right at the moment right what's the value of a stream um you know he's he's fight he's kicked back with ads all this sort of good stuff and i think a lot of the stuff is lost in communication because of joe uh, fuchs specifically because of joe budden's way of speaking where he shouts a lot he tends to speak in riddles he tends to speak you know whatever around topics sometimes if he doesn't want to uh maybe divulge too much or he just ends up maybe to maybe getting too emotional and then this clip popped up that everyone's basically been sharing online of an interview earlier in the year between bill burr and joe rogan where they essentially speak on the same thing the same issues right and bill burr has a word of caution for any up-and-coming content producer at the moment or content creator on a podcast on a youtube whatever it may be to be very wary of getting in business with these big corporations and to kind of mind your p's and q's i'm going to play in the background because you know uh what is it bent pixels loves to rip your stuff if you, they see you playing anything so let's just play a bit of the audio for you guys now at the moment let's get that off the screen and hear what bill burr and joe rogan has to say regarding it you know i'm piling up some stories here being in the matrix I won't get into them, but it's the same, it's just the same old 
corporations only know how to do business one fucking way. And well, it's just they it's, push their advantage. They push their advantage. They have their leverage and they want the biggest pie, slice of the pie. That's that's what they. Do. I don't have a problem with that. It's when they go beyond that and they just straight up steal. Are they stealing from yeah. you? Right they, now? Everybody does. Every every time you get in business with like corporate guys, this is how it works. It's like the check. Okay, we're in business to make money from them, and then you get in business with them, and then the check goes to the corporate guy, and then you get your cut off of his checkbook. So right there, I am immediately in a situation where there's no way I can steal from him, but he can rob me fucking blind. Right. And yeah. you can add a bunch of expenses yeah, onto things that— Front-end load yes. expenses to make yes. it look like they're losing money, and yeah. That's to, Hollywood accounting. Yeah. No, yeah. it's stealing. It's stealing is what yes. it is. They just call it Hollywood accounting. Yes. But, it, but it's not Hollywood accounting. It's, it's corporate accounting— it's scumbag accounting. That's just, and it's how they do it. And they sleep at night, and then they always ask, "Oh, that's over in the accounting section of the building, not over here where mm -hmm. me and my yacht are." Well, <laughs> we get in with. It's got no power in the business, and it's just like you know. Oh yeah, here we go. This is the bus. Is what they're going to do now is what the music industry did. Well, they started started signing straight across the board deals. They're going to get some young kid who's got no power in the business, and it's just like, you know, we'll help you create a podcast. You know, we're signed with so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. And what they're going to do is they're going to own the podcast. The advertising money is going to go to them, and they're going to rob them fucking blind. 100%. They're going to 100%, 100%. Going to fucking steal from them, rob them fucking blind. And then when they get audited and they get caught stealing, they're going to label that kid, that young comic, difficult to work with. <laughs> Meaning difficult to steal from. That's... It's and isn't that just a perfect encapsulation of Joe Budden and how he's been treated by Spotify? It's just a perfect representation of it, isn't it? And even if you look at it um, in a deeper level, it's basically another reflection on what's going on with Joe Rogan at the moment now with Spotify, right? Where he's essentially been censored. There is a possibility of his show getting, you know, taken off of Spotify. All this sort of nonsense that's occurring behind the scenes. And it all comes into play because he got into business with a corporation. So I've always been surprised at the fact at the reluctance of some of the bigger podcasts some of the pitchy people that are on joe Bunn's level to just you know sign up with a service like spotify straight away i guess maybe to secure the bag but it's always surprised me why they're so quick to kind of sign up to these platforms straight away especially considering the the rabid fandom that kind of circles around Joe Budden and the Joe Budden podcast, right? And, and all their guys that support it, Rory Moore um, and Parks, right? They have a very um, devoted fan base. They don't need to go to a Spotify or to an Apple to do this, right? They could just essentially set up their own Patreon, sell merch. Um, of course, when once we return to having live shows, they could be making money or hand over fist, right? They don't need to um, go to a corporation and give up, you know, ownership or give up creative control just so they can secure the bag earlier on. I don't think that's necessary. I think it's better to basically do what Joe Budden or Joe Brogan has done, follow that model where you basically do it on your own for ages, you get ads, you basically sell, you basically use the platform to promote the other things you do whether it's stand-up comedy, MMA, um, whatever else it is, provide a platform for your friends to get famous, blah, 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 blah. And then when it comes to the opportunity for you to actually go and secure the bag from a big, reputable company that's maybe going to allow you to expand your voice, maybe you're going to allow you to plug into some bigger resources, whatever it may be, then you do it at that time. You need to do it so early on. It doesn't, it's not really necessary. Um, and again, it's just unlucky for Joe Budden too, I think. I think um, they're signing at the time when they signed to Spotify. I don't think Spotify really saw the potential of the show i don't even think at that time they were maybe thinking of buying of licensing the joe rogan podcast even i think they just they just kind of threw out a harry a hail mary and hope for the best so like close their eyes and hope for the best and then suddenly the podcast and landscape changes completely right within 18 months maybe two years and then suddenly um joe budden's sort of brand equity podcasting space uh potential for growth is ripe so of course things are going to change of course joe budden's going to be like hey whatever terms i signed prior to this boom in the industry i was definitely going to change now that this boom has happened i've contributed something to it so i definitely agree with that i just would hope that they would uh, i would hope now anyway especially since they've kind of reneged on the spotify deal that they would use this time to maybe just do it on their own for a bit and see how that goes and if they need to secure the bag later on down the line they're in a far better position to do it when they can prove that they've number one done it on one platform only that's the thing with joe, Bud with joe budden everyone keeps forgetting he won he was successful just putting the podcast only on spotify especially for the most 
part. Of course, they put the clips and some of the the whole episode, you know, a couple of days later on YouTube. But most of the time, people access the podcast directly through Spotify. So you know, they um they they essentially uh were responsible for let's say X amount of new users on the platform, hundred thousand. Let's say I don't know how many it is. Um. So he can prove that in those numbers. And he can also prove if he says on his own for a bit and they're independent, they can prove that, hey, we did this on our own too, right? Six months to a year, just grinding on YouTube, putting it up on Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. That could really go a long way to um, improving the numbers that they get for their next deal going forward. Because I'm sure they're going to secure the bag somewhere else. I, I don't think, I don't think even, even if, even if, even if um, you believe that Joe Biden's business acumen isn't what it should be, I still think if you're a bit, if you're a corporation, if you're a DSP, if you're a tech company, there's no way you can see the numbers that they do and not be interested in trying to align yourself with the Joe Biden podcast. But I thought it was interesting that Bill Burr effectively said what Joe Biden said in a nicer way, let's say. Uh, da, 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 da. What else to talk about here? What else, what else, what else, what else, what else, what else, what else? Oh, okay. This is another one interesting uh, article. This is from Fader. I think I might have spoke about it prior. I'm not too sure, but Fader basically... Um, this is carrying on from the Daniel Ek story. Uh, Spotify CEO Daniel Ek says working musicians may no longer be able to release music only once every three to four years, which definitely kicked up a fuss with a lot of musicians online. People were, uh, you know, annoyed by what he said, but I think there was some validity in it. I just think it's a wrong vessel, and I also think some people online are just, you know, it's the constant argument between like biz, was it between like um, artist and business, right? Between being a business and being an artist, sometimes they can they can be conflicting, but I get his point. So basically, he says the following. Spotify CEO Daniel Ek discussed the dreaming and uh, sustainability in a recent interview with Music Ally published on Thursday. Ek denied criticism that Spotify pays insufficient royalties to artists and insisted that the role the musician had changed in today's future landscape, which I definitely agree. I don't think anyone can disagree with that. I do think whatever it meant to be an artist in the 20s and the 30s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s is entirely different to what it means to be an artist in the 2000s. Um, the what's, what's required Required of you how to gain an audience how to build an audience um how to construct a song uh the content of your music the soundscape of your music the branding the marketing it's completely different um landscape so of course that's going to uh call for a different approach in order to win it continues there. it said it claimed that the narrative fallacy that had been created caused music fans to believe that spotify doesn't pay musicians enough to stream their music some artists he said that used to do well in the past may not do well in the future landscape where you can't record music every three or four years i think that's going to be in that's not I, I think that's going to be enough which is true i guess that was a triggering part of it there is some truth to it i think it's hard for any artist to accept the word of a businessman of a suit of a ceo of somebody that fundamentally i think maybe uh ruined music for the worst especially when you look at spotify how it used how it works on the app on my phone you can't exactly play an album from beginning to end it automatically forces you to shuffle the album so you lose the sequencing that the artist put together you lose the flow um the tonality completely gets fucked up with it um of course depending on the algorithm it might just jump you straight towards the flipping lead single and if you haven't listened to it or you don't care about it it's definitely going to throw off the entire album and maybe taint the listening experience too right i look at albums similar to how i look at maybe entering a church right it's sort of like you walk up the stairs you have a bit of a palate cleanser or going through a reception and suddenly especially old catholic churches you walk into the main cathedral and you're like wow you know what i mean um you're awestruck um, all your troubles are kind of washed away in that one moment you pray you sing you dance you do all that good stuff and it kind of they kind of you know it's a sort of a, it's a sort of a, um is you sort of been hypnotized right throughout the entire proceedings and then by the time you leave it's a rich experience but imagine you just walk in and it's the middle of the sermon you don't get the the, the joy of the sunday service from if you actually there from the beginning so i think music is uh, albums are similar like that you have to listen to them from the beginning to end to get any kind of idea whether or not this album is good or not whether or not the singles work or not like there's been many singles i think even the nas nas is a good example that nas album that dropped recently right that single about uh uh, ultra black right it was terrible when it dropped i didn't like it at all the actual song itself then you listen to ultra black in sequence on the actual album and it sounds phenomenal so it 
goes to show that listening to albums is really important, but Spotify has effectively ruined it. So I understand how some artists could look at him that way, but I still think he, is, he has some validity in what he's saying. I st- it, it depends. So this last bit where he says, well, you can't record music once every three or four years, I think that's enough. That's true. It depends what kind of artist you are. If you're an artist, brand new artist, you have to kind of capture the um, attention of people. How I basically realized from YouTube, the more I upload, the more, consist- the more consistent I am, the more my numbers grow, the more viewers I get, the more comments I get, the more subs I get, blah, 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 right? It's a it's a kind of volume game, consistency game. And it's also, yeah, it's almost a consistency game. So people kind of know what to expect from you. So if you're a new artist, you can't afford to just be dropping once every three or four years because you don't have any fans. You want to build an audience. So you have to kind of continue to keep dropping music. Fair enough. But if you're an established act who's known to take their time, you're a Fiona Apple or somebody of that ilk, people are going to be okay with waiting three or four years because you've, you know, you've kind of trained them to expect that from you over the years of you making music, you know, prior to streaming, um, you know, taking over the industry. But I think nowadays it'll be very difficult for you to be aloof, um, Tracy Chapman-esque and just like refuse interviews, um, refuse media obligations, withdraw yourself, just put out music and speak to your fans through albums and think that's going to work. It's very difficult. It can be done, but it's very difficult. If you want to give yourself the best possible opportunity, your best is coming in the door being Mr. Accessible Man, interviewing everybody, talking and then kind of maybe withdrawing as time goes on right maybe like a frank ocean is a good example um he, he basically did you no know, he basically was recruited from the beginning but you know what i mean right so i, I think there's some validity now it continues it says um what is required music uh, for, from successful musicians Eck insisted is a deeper more consistent and prolonged commitment than in the past he says the artists today that are making it realize that it's about creating a continuous um engagement with their fans it's about putting in the work uh, about storytelling the album and about keeping continuous dialogue with their fans which is true again it's triggering but hey man how many artists do you know i know quite a few people who are up and coming doing their thing on the underground who are who have a good work ethic they don't exist there's not a lot of them right right um the the majority of artists kind of take for granted what they have if they have even a small fan base they're not very driven they're not self-critical um they don't have that hustle about them so i can imagine a lot of these people are probably maybe some of the same who are the most vocal about the complaints when it comes to spotify streams and i think unfortunately in this current landscape we just know well as it sits today especially when you're getting was it 0.0.0 cents a dollar per stream it just doesn't make any sense for anyone to complain about this when you know what the climate is and everyone knows now that where the money is for musicians is going to be live shows, merch and all that good stuff. That, that's going to be where your actual coin is going to be made. You're going to have to rely on the music to be sort of like a business. I always look at albums like business cards nowadays, right? They're like a way for people to maybe remember you to check you out all this sort of good stuff and then you're hoping once they like a couple of tunes they might follow your career they might buy a couple of pieces of merch they might come to a meet and greet buy a ticket to a show do you know what I mean that's what you're hoping to happen um i think so i don't necessarily see anything bad in what he said but again i just think it was maybe the wrong vessel especially when you consider that he's not an artist or music himself he's just a tech startup dude isn't it that came in and basically filled the niche but yeah that was that one Next on the list, we've got this flipping mad story about this lady called Jessica Krug who essentially um, tricked everyone at her university into believing that she was a black woman. And considering the picture that we're looking at at the moment, I don't know how she managed that, but God damn it, what a funny LOL story. This might be a clear indication of the dangers and the perils of uh, obsessing over race, these perils of um, identity, or the, yeah, the, the unintended consequences of identity politics, right? It might be. That is because on one end, if you're going to go around telling people that the most important thing about them is their identity, right? The most important thing is how they identify, is how the world sees them. It's not the, you know, the content of their character, what they do for their communities about their own racial identity. And if you put that as the most important thing in somebody, um, if you kind of frame your, you know, ex- Equal, what's the thing? Equilibrium, not equilibrium. What's that thing? If you form your, blah, blah, my mind's going blank. If you form your <laughs> syllabus around that, and you hire people based on their race, and you put, you make that basically the most important thing. It, ha- it, it, there's no, it shouldn't be surprising when somebody tries to take advantage of that, and tries to basically use it, takes advantage of it in order to kind of further their career because they're worried 
because they're a white woman that essentially they're going to be behind uh they're going to be at the back of the line because we're living in a moment now where if you're loud enough and your skin color happens to be dark enough you can effectively shame yourself into a career it's not honorable it's not the most um uh ethical thing to do um you probably wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing that you cheated your way into a position or maybe you would i don't know but this is definitely the time where if you make up enough of a fuss about a lineup about an appointment about a boardroom whatever it may be you can definitely wangle your way in as a diversity hire which is quite possibly one of the worst one of my biggest nightmares right it's advantageous in some regards because it allows you to maybe skip a couple of steps but knowing full well that you're only at a company because of your economic or societal background or your race is i don't know man for me it just seems a bit demeaning i would rather not get the position based on my race or get the position based on the content of my work than get it primarily because i happen to be black that'll be my nightmare but i thought this was flipping hilarious because this woman doesn't look closest she she maybe she might look hispanic right if you told me she was hispanic fair enough but to tell us to tell me she's black is insane if this woman is for instance, Cardi B doesn't identify as black, right? She identifies as Latina or Hispanic, whatever, right? Cardi B is more looks more black than this woman, essentially, right? It's essentially it's just insane. This doesn't make any sense. But anyway, Professor investigated for posing as black has resigned. Uh, as black has resigned, the university says. Um, it continues here. It says a George George University University a George University sorry a George Washington University professor who was being investigated after a blog post published under her name said that she misrepresented herself as a black woman has resigned. The university said on Wednesday. The resignation of the professor Jessica A. Crew came after the university said it was looking into an essay on Medium posted under her name in which the writer described a prolonged deception of assuming black identities even though she's white and this is a medium post here it says the truth and the anti-black violence of my lies this is insane look how it starts for the better of my adult life better part of my adult life every move i've made every relationship i've formed has been rooted in in, in the napalm toxic soils of lies calm down woman not just any lies to an escalating degree over my adult life i i i have eschewed my lived experience as a white jewish child in suburban kansas under various assumed identities within a blackness that i had no right to claim first Afri first north african blackness then u.s rooted blackness then caribbean rooted bronx but i didn't even know that was a thing so she went through three phases of black she pretended to be moroccan egyptian then she pretended to be what some girl from alabama or something you're at some um, southern state somewhere and then she pretended to be caribbean mama mia this woman's mad well like puerto rico or something puerto rican i don't know um i've not only claimed these identities of my own when I'd absolutely no right to do so, when doing so is a very epitome of violence, of thievery, and of appropriation of a myriad of ways in which non-black people continue to use and abuse black identities and cultures. But I have formed instant, um, intimate relationship with loving, compassionate people who have trusted and cared for me when I have deserved neither trust nor caring. People have fought together with me, have fought for me, and my continued uh, appropriation of black Caribbean identity is not only in the starkest term wrong, unethical, immoral, anti-black, and colonial, but it means that every step I've taken has gaslit those who I'm love, those who are loved. At Jesus Christ, says the intention was never, never matters more than the impact. Yes, fair enough, good enough quote, but for me i don't know like um as a black guy i don't really care about this stuff i really don't um i think if anything this just goes to show how stupid some of these um what you, some of these policies are where you tend to kind of readdress the balance uh by hiring people based on their skin color this these are the unintended effects of it i think if anything we're in silly time now and we just need to do away with this and kind of realize that there are some issues in some institutions where there is a need for diversity but it doesn't come in it doesn't the way the way to address it isn't just to go and hire some black people the way to address it is to maybe get to the root cause as to why some people of a of a certain ethnic background are not basically predisposed to go to a certain area maybe it's an education thing maybe it's access whatever it may be address the actual core issue instead of just kind of plopping in people based on their color because effectively there's going to be some white people within that hiring process or within that institution that are going to be looking at it thinking hey what about me and then that's when they're going to go get in front of the mirror get out some shoe polish and essentially right go out there and pretend they're from angola or something like this is absolutely nuts 
But again, I just think it's a consequence of what's happening in general in society. And then this lady came out of the blue and basically threw this woman under the bus again and said, oh, I knew her personally and she's always been a bitch to me. So this woman called um, Yerima, was it? Yerima, Yerima Bonilla says the following. Um, Many are asking themselves how Jessica Krug managed to fool anyone into believing she was Afro-Latina. Well, let me tell you, we were both fellows at the, um, what's that, Schromberg, and I suppose she fooled me, a Fred. I mean, I don't hurt or betrayed, I mean, I don't feel hurt or betrayed in this moment because the truth is I always knew something was off about her, but I thought the pathology, the pathology she displays were the product of systemic violence and not of her twisted racial fantasies. <laughs> See, not only did she try to pass, we need a better term for that here that passive thing is odd too in it right do you pass a certain race here and there that's a very odd odd term but hey um as the tina from El Barrio, but she also told us her parents were addicts and even said that they were overdosed and suicide attempts happening during the fellowship period <laughs> It's bad enough if you kind of go out there pretending. Bad, I don't know, I'm rolling my eyes like um, Ocasio Cortez. It's bad enough if you're pretending to be black, right? But don't get your family and friends involved. Like, let leave them out of this, right? Don't invent these myths and these lies about your parents being crackheads so it can justify your likeness or your desire to, you know, cover yourself in shoe polish. That isn't a vibe. Like, you you've got something wrong in your head. Of course, she's mentally disturbed. Don't get me wrong. There's definitely some mental health issues going on there. But this is just lows, mate. Lol. She, um, she always dressed and acted inappropriately. She'd show up to a 10 a.m. scholar's seminar dressed for a salsa class. <laughs> Imagine in a very kind of uh, left-leaning, humanitarian-based university where everyone's sort of open and accepting of everyone's um, fashion and outlook and perspective and blah, blah, blah. You, you, you definitely want to say something, right? Because there are, there is always a time and a place like the Lizzo thing when she went to that basketball game with a hole that basically exposed her entire derriere right that wasn't an issue of her just being fat it wasn't like oh we're fat shaming no it was just like that's inappropriate why are you doing that um and of course you know in that moment it felt awkward to say that because you then you definitely felt like you were fat shaming you felt as if like you know you were adding to the chorus of people who say that she shouldn't be living free and wild because she happens to be a little bit rotund so i guess there's a there's that kind of thinking that comes into it where this lady where she rocks up to a meeting in the morning dressed in some spandex you know with some gold hoops on and her boobs pushed up to her face you want to be like uh we're not yeah that isn't the time or the place you don't want to say that because you know you it's just effectively you are got your trying you, you feel like you're maybe putting into question their race or their identity in general right you don't want to be that person it continues here. It says, in that sense, she did gaslight us, not only into thinking she was a woman of color, but also into thinking we were somehow both political and intellectually inferior. She says, while claiming to be a child of addicts from the hood, she boasted about speaking numerous languages, which she didn't speak, right? Imagine doing that. You're back in the day in school when there was that kid in class that always pretended they had all the computer games, but then whenever you'd ask to or try to invite yourself to go around, there was always something that was happening that would never let you go. And then suddenly you definitely came to a realization or something told you in school like, oh that guy's full of shit he always lies isn't it he? he doesn't have a ps4 an xbox and a nintendo he's got a game boy that's it um that's the same but imagine doing that with languages like just saying you speak spanish but no never speaking spanish what happens then when someone speaks it to you you just say yeah yeah si sí, si sí, claro claro but like, what do you say how do you pretend you speak spanish or that you speak italian or french like that's mad bro um do you think that people exist there's somebody people that exist out there that pretend that they they, they pretend like do you think someone exists out there that pretends they speak a language tries to get a job as a translator successfully gets it and then bluffs it the whole way through that is mad isn't it and they, they pick up a hefty way through translators so that's no uh that's no uh cheap occupation so yeah um she boasts about speaking numerous languages reading asian texts and mastering disciplinary methods while questioning the work of real women of color doing the transportive disciplinary work that she pans so that's um that's sort of gets the the horrible part of the issue not only was she pretending to be black she also was very critical and very confrontational or dismissive of the work of her fellow 
black professors at the university. So you can only imagine how some of them must be feeling now that she's been exposed as a fraud, which I think, you know, for the most part, I think she was probably afraid of a story coming out in one of the broad sheets and she wanted to get in front of it, which is a, probably a smart thing to do. But God almighty, man, I think a lot of that has to do with her own insecurity. She probably felt um, guilty and self-conscious and insecure about what she had done. So usually it's what happens, isn't it? It's like, what they say? Hurt people, hurt people. So she just went on the, on the offensive and tried to kind of go at it before anyone else got at her. It continues to say she consistently trashed women of color question their scholarship mama mia how can you question someone's scholarship when you got yours based on an absolute lie she even described by my colleague marissa fuentes as a slave catcher in the introduction of her book kind of amazing how white supremacy means that she even thought she was better at being a person of color than we were which is you know that's a stock one isn't it that's a harsh that's fucking real <laughs> oh my days was a psycho um that pathology remains evident in her M mia corporate article somehow she manages to remain ultra work and strident still in her political moral high horse calling for white scholars to be cancelled in this instance her own white self which is not not to be surprised it's not surprising that language that verbiage that goes out there to use the sound work we know what what it is we know what how we know the kind of cadence so she's just using it to advantage I, I think you can only blame yourselves or we can only blame ourselves as a society that we've allowed it to get to a point where if people use certain words in a sentence in a good way, it means an ally they use it in a bad way. Suddenly they are a transphobe or, you know, an ist or something, right? That's where we got to. So she basically used that to advantage. She basically used the entire scheme to advantage. She pretended she was black so she could get scholarship, pretended she was black so she could be, get, you know, um, advantages and being a professor that she wouldn't have got maybe she was white because of affirmative action or whatever it may be like she's basically used all these tricks against the very people who they're meant to benefit in some way shape or form um she says she always da, 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 da. She, she 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 says she doesn't know what accountability looks like well clearly she needs to quit her job since no scholar can be respected when they engage in this kind of fraud um second she needs to start a fellowship fund for afro latina scholars and fund it with at least as much money as she obtained through her lies imagine the amount of money she claimed through the university you know, oh my god first she needs to stop with the dollars i was explaining about how wrong her actions and philosophizing about her punishment i'm not in investing a single drop in energy in punishing her especially not in the middle of a pandemic instead i will commit recommit to race radical self-community care which i agreed with and then it brings me on to the second one another lady got caught uh, a grad student admits lying about being black but this is this is definitely a problem in the states isn't it do you, is, do you think that happens in the uk no there is isn't it there's that girl i covered ages ago on a podcast who was black fishing and i think there's a few scandinavian girls that do it most of those scandinavian girls are girls that you know love a bit of rum they're you know they are very yeah they love a bit of rum which aka they love black dudes anyway in general um black dudes seem to like them and they kind of play up the fact that you know they especially if they have a bit of melanin in their skin or if they're a bit olive they sort of purposely tan themselves even more to make them look a certain way which has always been bizarre to me especially when they get caught up on it they're always a bit super dismissed this defensive when it's like we know what you're doing like just own it and just keep it moving and it's not a bad thing but this this girl did exactly the same thing i think there's a video of her actually talking in it right uh let's see here it's in the background this kid, this woman here, let's, this this woman pretended she was black. She looks nuts. Like, some of these people that pretend they're black, some of them deserve actual, they might actually deserve the scholarships, you know, because if that lady is black, then I don't know, man. But hey, it says a graduate student in the University of Wisconsin has apologized and resigned from their teaching job and workers' union leadership position after years of embracing lies about their racial identity. Um, C.V. Vitolo Haddad, who uses the non-binding pronouns they and them, admitted that they are actually Southern Italian and Sicilian. <laughs> that's basically that's basically um what you call it ariana grande in it ariana grande is i only learned this recently ariana, ariana grande is italian she's not latina um she's not south american she's not central american she's from italy like she's like italy italian italian like do you know what i mean it's it's a madness i actually clocked that what the other day someone mentioned it in a thing let me see ariana grande latina and someone had the image of what she actually looks like um vis-a-vis -vis what she looks like now and yeah there's a bit of sand bed involved and probably some tanning and you know whatever it may be but god damn it she looks like she tries to pass herself as a camila cabello looking woman but she's not right she's just a, a regular you know uh pretty white lady from uh italy i think here's the image i'm gonna put up now on the screen it's like god almighty look at that style evolution they say yeah look at that on the screen 
that's what she's meant to look like, or maybe these two, and then that's what she looks like now at the moment. It's like, Jesus, McGee's. I don't know what it is about these people. But hey, um, she says, not black and Latina, which are both labels that sh they accepted when peers... Imagine referring to yourself as... Oh, Jesus Christ. This is so confusing. Okay, cool. Uh, they accepted when peers allegedly assumed they were a person of color. Um, when sh when asked if I identify as black, my answer should have always been no. Vitola Hadid wrote um, on September the 8th in a second of two confessions on Medium. They were three separate instances I said otherwise. I have let guesses about my interest history become answers I wanted uh, but couldn't prove. Vitola Hadid previously said in an apology published on 6th on September that I have let people make assumptions when I should have corrected them. I guess this is similar to that guy that lied about being in, a, in, a, in the Twin Towers when it when it went down. It went, yeah, lied about being in the towers at 9-11 um, it started off like that I think he because he's a because he's a you know hardcore New Yorker and he happened to work in that area someone asked him hey were you in the towers like you know really concerned wide eyed and he just used the opportunity to say yes because he thought there was no other way to get out of it and then that person told two other people they then went and asked him again and he had to just keep the lie up and then it got to a point where he just the lie got too much and he had to kind of um, you know rewrite his wrongs but by then you know, he became the 9-11 faker guy, right? And uh, this is the same sort of instance where you're basically, you know, at a house party somewhere, people are asking, oh, wait, what's your ethnicity, man? Like, you look you look like you're mixed. Are you from, like, Egypt? And you're like, oh, da, da, no, actually, I'm, I'm from Nigeria or something. You're like, excuse me? Madness, man. She continues here. She says, um, in the second, in the second missive, uh, Vitolo Haddad added, I want to apologize for ever taking li uh, for ever taking lies about Cuban roots at face value and for subsequently attaching myself to people's perceptions of me as though it would provide answers where they are none. <laughs> I can imagine all these people are the types where, you know, somebody missed, somebody miss ethnicized them, right? Uh, or misguessed the ethnicity and they just held on to it. Someone's once you know you know you know the kind of person that you know have you ever seen a person where they get complimented or told they look like a certain celebrity and they just lean into it super hard? It's really creepy. But same thing happens with I guess with these kind of racially ambiguous people where you know especially in an era where in the humanities you get rewarded if you are somebody from a marginalized racial group. I it, I'm not surprised they will take advantage of the system. I really not. Of course, don't get me wrong. It's disgusting. It's heinous, but the game is the game now at the moment isn't it literally people are playing up to it uh, people are playing up it's the the trauma they've gone through to get positions like it is what it is if it's getting rewarded people are going to take advantage of it one way or the other she says um however in a series of text messages vitola had told reporters i repeated things i had heard growing up from my family that i now know to be lies oh she's blaming look everyone's always doing this blaming other people throwing them under the bus she's doing the what's it the elizabeth warren thing right she's blaming her parents for telling her she was uh american indian or whatever it may be or native it's like jesus christ so i repeated the things i heard growing up from my family that i now know to be lies i'm so sorry i take full responsibility for spreading those lies and i'm deeply sorry um in the initial post vitola had also expressed a desire to make amends for every ounce of heartbreak and betrayal and deception cause others like that woman isn't but why would she even like it's just like what's the point isn't it? Is there no advantage in the humanities to being what? What is she? Italian, Cuban, whatever. She's Italian. Is there no advantage of that either? Can't you just pretend to be? Because you pretend to be from Nicaragua. No one would bat an eyelid, right? Why the black thing? Like black must be such a high currency in humanities that it just you just have to risk it. Due to controversy, the graduate student who studies in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication has given up the teaching position and stepped down as co-president of the school's chapter on teaching assignments assistant association (TAA). Jesus Christ, she had a custody job, a graduate student union. However, Vitola Haddad has also claimed that they have never identified as non-white on paper or attempted to gain access to scholarships and awards provided. Uh, Vitola Haddad, Haddad, sorry, admission comes less than two weeks after African histories and Western George Washington University professor Jessica Krug, blah, 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 blah. Like, that is insane, isn't it? Imagine living in a place where you're rewarded for your race in this way right to, to some advantage especially if you come from a you know a, a bit of a bad background and then there's people taking advantage of it such as this lady in order to kind of bolster their career and they're fully white like not even like mixed oh yeah i'm just no fully fully white it's like so so odd like one of the oddest things i've ever seen in my life man like uh, I, I don't understand and then to end it because you know end it on a bit of fun and then a bit of fun. We've got this really interesting, um, funny uh, tweet 
that has been, you know, gone viral on the timeline, uh, courtesy of Wayne Lineker. Gary Lineker is illustrious and often problematic uh, older brother who got on Instagram to effectively um, crowdsource his missus. And if you know anything about this guy, you'll know that, you know, he's got a bit of a reputation as being a bit of a ladies' man in his older age and a bit of a creep in some people's eyes and, you know, whatever it may be. And, um, yeah, some of these stipulations or some of the things that he's kind of <laughs> looking for in women <laughs> make you really, really, really laugh. So this is the post someone shared on Twitter, Instagram post. It says the following way Lineker says, so my family have decided I need a girlfriend for my own sanity and health. So here's my criteria okay let's start things off like normal right so here's him taking a really great cool guy picture you know camera down below shooting up nice bit of light great glasses on um he's got his hair he's you know his signature beard trimmed doing the damn thing white t-shirt on maybe a bit too tight a couple of buttons undone ready to do the thing here's his criteria he says strong nice loving personality check now more things more the important things right so that, that's the thing that you say when you're trying to be um coy and trying to be nice you know like some of the personality and you know someone that makes me laugh but let's get to the actual nitty-gritty of it right like bra size hand size all that sort of stuff right let's get to it he says the following you must like older men but not only me i don't know what that means does that mean he wants a, it's a cuck situation or does that just mean in general i don't know you have to be a worldy and above 30. <laughs> and if you know anything about worldy in the UK, you know that's slang for like a 10 out of 10, right? That's what he wants. You have to be a worldy and above a 30. Okay, 28, 29 could work. Um, but not my age as that could just look weird, right? Because he's 60. So he's saying women that look 60 look weird, but men that fuck 30-year-olds or younger, because, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with his social media feed, you know that some of the girls that happen to uh, cross his paths don't necessarily look like they're a day older than, I don't know, 18, right? In some respects, sometimes 21. Now, I'm not putting any mud on his name. I'm just saying how I see it, right? Some of these Caucasian ladies, they don't necessarily... White girls are weird, right? They look really young for a long period of time and then they just look really old or they look really old when they're young and they just keep looking older. There's no middle ground. So if you see a girl, a white lady that happens to look like she's 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, believe your eyes. They're probably that age move away get on the bus call the police run do whatever you can do get out of that sector but if they happen to look older they probably are older it is what it is so for him to say that people his age look weird is it just goes to show just where he is at in it at the moment but bloody hell what a legend he says you must be you must like to travel and fly to business class which is a weird requirement of course everyone's gonna like that and stay in incredible hotels oh man i don't know actually you know what i prefer to stay in the easyjet hotel that's what i prefer i prefer to stay in a generator hostel that's what i like to do actually i prefer to stay in um and a random person's sofa because that's where i like to get down like what uh be prepared to give up your career or job or at least be able to work from a laptop on a tropical beach somewhere oh the horror if i wonder if iceland will let me would you reckon if your cells is in iceland i'll let you work remotely um shacked up with wayne lineker as he's flipping pla ha hammering you down day in day out um you need to spend the summer in Ibiza and the winter in Dubai. Oh, the horror. With two weeks in the UK for Christmas and New Year with the families and holidays in the Maldives. No baggage as mine as uh, uh, no baggage as mine are all grown up. Which was that? No, baggage is kids, he means. No baggage. He's referring to children. His children as baggage. He's a mad guy. Uh, mine are all grown up. <laughs> is that what he means? <laughs> oh my god. A dog is acceptable, but we need to be, have a passport. Okay, great. Daddy likes pets. You must be able to cook as I love cooking. That's odd, isn't it? You must like to cook because I love cooking. Or does it mean you like yeah, you must be able to cook because I like eating? Especially waitress ready meals. Okay, he's being funny. Also you also don't need to be verified. I can sort that out for you. <laughs> House music and RB lovers only. Oh man, how about if you like techno? No rock or heavy or pop music. Damn it, man. So if you like uh, Robin, he's not into you. Uh, if you like Adele, he's not into you. If you like uh, Taylor Swift, he's not into you. Damn it. That rules out a big chunk of women, actually. Um, Little Mix. They're not exactly R&B, are they? Um, you must like uh, Netflix, especially Money Heist. Oh, he's got such... He's got such... For somebody so picky, he's got such basic bitch taste, hasn't he? Right? He's so average. So, like, vanilla, right? He's so fucking... Um, what's that sandwich you get in Waitress that's got those little cloves on it with butter? Do you know what I mean? Like, just standard, right? He's, he doesn't even put... Like, he doesn't even put ketchup on, on his chips, right? No, no salt. Just, like, straight straight potato straight fried potato in his mouth like god damn it man 
all these stipulations and you fucking like money heist netflix like come on what a weapon um no chick flicks watch them with your own mates <laughs> He needs to be confident enough to be able to go to the front of the queue in nightclubs and accept a table. What does that even mean? That's a whole different world, isn't it? You need to be confident enough to go to the front of a queue at a nightclub. What is that a thing in, in that culture? In that kind of table service, glitzy, high heels, sparklers and drinks, boys wearing skinny jeans with Balenciagas? Is that part of the culture where girls feel co- like self-conscious about going to the front of the queue? Why do you feel self-conscious if you know you're going to get in, if your name's on the door? I guess because you think, oh, you might be on, the, you might not be on the list. But imagine if you're a girl and you go to a, a, a very swanky club somewhere, you get your best dress on, you know, you wax your legs, uh, you put on your fake lashes, and you, you know, you make sure everything is tight and snatched. There's no way you're gonna be rocking up to a club not knowing that you're on the list, isn't it? You're gonna make sure you're on there. Your friends are gonna make sure that they cross their their t- they, they cross their t's and dot their eyes, right? So this this stipulation is very odd. Or maybe it's just a common thing. Maybe it's just a shy thing in general. But I'd imagine those kind of girls that, you know, they love to show out. They you definitely want to walk past the queue, show everyone your nice little dress that you're rocking out. So that's a very odd, odd thing to say. But hey, um, blah, 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 blah. And accept the table and free drinks from the owners. You need to be, you need a driving license to share a Bentley and Lamborghini Jeep. And <laughs> of course, that, that's always going to get those. The materialism here is insane. Uh, you must never have shared a teeth whitening post. Okay. I don't get what that means. I'm not on any dating. Again, he's, he likes money heists, but then he's um, shaming you for sharing one of those teeth whitening things. It's like, okay. Uh, I'm not on any dating sites. You shouldn't be too. I'm not on any. F- I'm not on OnlyFans, so you shouldn't be too. Which is odd. Again, so controlling, isn't it? Imagine, right? All these fucking stipulations for essentially what a living shag doll or something, a human shag doll. That's essentially what you are, right? Isn't it? Right? He's gonna dress you, feed you. Uh, or you know, you're gonna feed him. He's gonna dress you. You can't bring your kids. If you've got kids, kill them. Right? If you've got a dog, kill it too. Unless it's got a passport. You know, he's going to be like, this is maddening, bro. A maddening post. Um, he says, you must love the gym, uh, health food, and have body def- definition as as I will have soon. So I guess that rules out Lizzo, right? That rules out Gemma Collins. That rules out anyone that has a BMI over whatever. Accept the love of my children and grandchildren and realize no more kids for me. Never say never do. Again, like, what does that mean? Is that easy? That's, he's just dangling the carrot in front of some poor lady's head, right? Because essentially he's never going to have kids with these people or he's never going to settle down with them. You must be able to let my PA, David Hodge, book all our... Oh, okay, I better say. I better say you must let my PA, David Hodge, what do you call it? Cave your back in from time to time. What the fuck? <laughs> it's a good thing he's got a dude as a PA though, isn't it? Because imagine this guy had a female as a PA. Like that would be, you know, that would be a messy office. Let's say that, right? That 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 uh that bin would be full, and I'm not talking about paper. Ah, <laughs> oh, these guys are flipping creep, isn't it? Capital C. This is what men should like. This is it's interesting because. I think there's a lot of dudes, similar to the Dan Brazarian, there's a lot of dudes who probably think this is a this is alpha male. Like this is what you should be this is like peak masculinity. And this is this is what girls actually want. When really the fact of the matter is that if he wasn't rich and famous, if he didn't own that nightclub that he owns in Ibiza, no one would give a shit about him in this regard, right? Most of the attention that he gets, most of the um uh, most of his kind of sex appeal or attraction, yeah, attraction potential, whatever it is, right? Most of it comes from the fact that he's built up a name uh, through hard work and whatever he's done of making a brand. He's built up an aura and a brand around himself. He could look like, he could he could honestly look like Casey Neistat in the face and people would still want to suck him off, right? He could be five foot five and look completely horrible, have a hunchback and, you know, really wiry spaghetti arms and girls would still want to get, you know, get on with him because he's essentially the dude that, you know, is responsible for putting on some memorable IB for nights and hosting in legendary parties and booking legendary DJs. Like, and he's, you know, related to somebody very famous. Like, he would still be that guy. That would still be the case. So for him to be so uh, judgmental on how people look and stuff is very interesting considering that, you know, hey, continue here. You must, you, you just, okay, so the, you need book a flights and purchase items for you online, which is odd. So again, you, you're basically a, a human shag doll. He wants his PA to blow your back out and to maybe buy you some stuff on fucking Boohoo or Pretty Little Things. And then he also wants you to be comfortable with what? Cooking for him? So you're a living shag doll maid in a way. 
You just need to send a link to, to him. You must be able to accept my friends, even uh, Tony, whatever that guy is, as I will accept yours. Accept that I have to reply to girls' DMs, not just guys, which is odd, okay? Accept I have to, like, what? Is it business, right? When you're posting a picture of you and your six pack and some like 10 from ecuador tells you oh nice pack like you have to you have to tell that girl has to accept that that is a business con conversation like god almighty man god bless whoever ends up with him anyway one last thing your geography needs to be on point as girls that girls girls that i think lincoln is in worlds is not good be intelligent but not boring and outgoing suits outgoing suits what do you mean um okay outgoing suits um wifey where you at banter hashtag real so yeah, that took over the timeline and I, I don't know, some of the responses are pretty epic. Somebody posted here underneath um, would suit whoever that person is. They said, just had a look, potential LOL followed back. Like he what he posted back on there. It says, to, this woman posted, I'm not sure if she's actually being serious or not. She says, I'm available, 29 car license, boat license, dive instructor, workout every morning at 6 a.m. <laughs> ah, this is so horrible, man. Look at what we've reduced ourselves to in society. Uh, currently a charter yachts for a living. So what, is she like a, below, she's like one of those um, contestants from Below the Deck? Um, you'd imagine those kind of girls, uh, again, should, is that true? Would you imagine some of those girls have probably seen a fair number of STD, STDs or STIs? I would imagine so, right? If you're on a boat all the time surrounded by other fit, athletic males or females, whatever you're into, and rich, affluent guests, you know, you, there's probably some hanky-panky going on there. It continues. Um, maybe our first date should be on one. Living in Cyprus, but I'm more than happy to leave. Of course you would be. One time I left a funny comment on one of your Twitter posts and you replied, because that's how hilarious I am. I'm used to walking to the front of queues because I can come from a town that's small enough that everyone knows. Why would it... Honestly, this front of... Someone explain in the comments below. What's the issue with girls not wanting to walk in front of a queue? Like, what's, what's this about? Is that like a thing? Like, girls don't like working in front of the queue. What they do, they just wait around the corner for what? Someone to come. Oh, I guess it's fit, right? Okay. I guess girls get embarrassed when they stand in front of a queue and the promoter guy, whoever it is wearing, you know, the promoter guy is the same old dude that has like a velvet blazer on, skinny jeans and Louboutin loafers or something stupid, something enough like that, right? Or a really tight polo top. Um, when that guy isn't at the door able to get you in, you're having to be on your phone and check. It's just awkward, isn't it? So I guess they wait until the last minute. When a person comes to the door, then they get rushed to the front. I'm assuming. But that's a very odd thing. Um, and then to end here, about time I expanded my horizons. Let me know if you're interested. Like, wow, man. Again, what a life in some regards. I think, you know, if you're Robbie from AFTV, you're probably saying, that must be nice, right? When you remember when you interviewed Ovi and he was just sitting there thinking, wow, just imagine what it must be like to look like Ovi and have girls just like throwing, you know, throwing nan at you, innit? This must be it. But God damn it, man. It's just not a good reflection of reality, isn't it? Because this guy seems to occupy a very certain seg he seems to attract a very certain uh, he seems to yeah, he seems to occupy a very he lives in a very particular group, right? He's in a particular niche. It's not very representative of the wider world in that respect. But hey, credit to Wayne Lineker, man. What do you think? Do you think Wayne Lineker is gonna find himself a wifey? via Instagram, is he just trolling? Um, if you're a female and you're watching this, do you think Wayne Lineker's hot? Is he somebody that you would want to shack up with and get him to pay your bills, drive you around in his Lamborghini truck pending? <laughs> Allow his PA to blow your back out and from time to time in exchange for, you know, uh, gift cards to go to fucking ASOS? Like, what the fuck, man? This guy is an absolute legend. Absolute legend, man. What a legend he is. Wayne Lineker, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, that is the Action on Zinger Show episode number 374. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If it's your first time watching the show via YouTube, please make sure you kick like, you know, you smash that like button. Uh, make sure you hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you're watching via the podcast or listen to via the podcast, like, make sure you leave me a five-star review. Download the show and share with your friends. If you're going to support the show, please do via Patreon. Link is down below. Patreon.com for just Agostino. You can find the entire library that I post via my podcast as well as this podcast in full HD mode before it goes anywhere else on Patreon.com for just Agostino. Until next time, friends, see you very, very soon. Take care, be safe, and I'll see you on the other side. Bye.